perspective of it is a, a caterpillar. Um, it is becoming more of what it is, so it's flourishing on that basis. It is rapidly consuming a substantial fraction of the environment that's necessary for it to continue being what it is. Um, and then this ends up in one of two possible states. Either it hits some kind of wall where some piece of that support structure fails, in which case it just dies, um, or it actually enters into this moment of metamorphosis and it transforms into another kind of being altogether. I think that's the perspective that I'm bringing. Um, I can't speak for anyone else. Hey, it's Christian. Um, playing with some new toys today, so we're going to see how this goes. I'm just de deciding to just jump in and uh, get some thoughts out on uh, Jordan Hall's conversion to Christianity. Paul brought this out on, Paul Vanderclay brought this out on his channel a few days ago, and I'm not like, <laughs> he is the master at capture, grab, idea, process, synthesize, put out, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is all new to me. So besides the point, I had some thoughts about it. I listened to the sections that he highlighted and um, and it kind of pulled some things out of me of some ideas that I've been chewing on for several years. Uh, the other part of it is that Jordan Hall, I, I think I probably brushed up against him on Rebel Wisdom years ago when he was brought on early, didn't know about his subsequent journeys and stories, but... Um, it got me thinking about the first time I, well, early on when I encountered Paul and uh, Rebel Wisdom produced this uh, kind of like Matrix documentary about kind of the meaning crisis pretty pretty early on in the YouTube space. And uh, so I decided to take a look back and see what Paul Vanderclay had to say when he was on, asked to be a part of that because he had been documenting, documenting the um, rise of Jordan Peterson and synthesizing kind of a Christian perspective on that. So let's take a look at this. How has it been as well? Because Peterson has obviously been getting more and more controversial. And I've kind of felt this as well, sort of like you end up getting in, into conversations. No, he didn't mean that. It wasn't about that. How has, how has that been? Like if people started arguing with you or judging what you're saying or how's that been? I deeply suspect there are a number of friends of mine that are deeply concerned for me because of this Jordan Peterson thing. Because they hear, again, the soundbite world grabs a few things. Jordan Peterson is a bigot. He's transphobic. He's homophobic. He's, you know, the godfather of the patriarchy, whatever he is. And so Paul, but the thing is, they know me. They know I'm not a bigot. They know... They know where I was raised. They know who's in my church. They know, they know me by my actions. So what to do with this? I've given Jordan Peterson, in a sense, a year of my life. What Few do you more do with sense. that? Well, they don't know what to do with that. So they're quiet, and they watch, and they wait. I, I do think YouTube is a place for people with little to lose. And my I guess we'll see. Uh, yeah, I've had the same sentiments, and in a certain way, whether that's even with like uh, conversations, very close friends. And I, I would be interested for Paul kind of about those relationships that maybe he sussed out that did have concern for him, what their thoughts are now versus back when this was produced five or six years ago. And um, anyways, but that was... That was Paul's connection to Rebel Wisdom early on, early when they first got started. And um, I remember watching that take place in real time and just being like, whoa, wow, this is kind of going somewhere. And uh, not being in a place in my own life to really engage with it that way, like I'm trying to now, but it was fun to tag along. So Jordan Hall, Rebel Wisdom, Paul Vanderclay, um, let's see, he chose, 
the the part that stuck out to me with Jordan Hall was his attraction to this place in North Carolina called Black Mountain. Because I, when I heard that, I was like, well, I've been there. I kind of know the the milieu, the culture, what's kind of that thing. And and hearing the front end of his story on the podcast about these searches for the ideal for his family, for his life, for meaning. Uh, I had kind of heard snippets. He's gone to cities and that was like a big deal. And he's gone to different countries and he's gone to Hawaii to paradises. And he, and he finds himself nestled in the smoky mountains in a town, less than 10,000 people. And I was just like, well, that's really interesting. So um, let's take a listen to him kind of, tell his story a piece that piece of the story getting there and then i want to kind of we're going to kind of look at black mountain so as you know we did an rv trip in late 2020 we went all the way up to the monastery the mm -hmm. high point of the map and then came all the way back down and on the way down we had Asheville on the list and we skipped it the only place we skipped on the whole trip we just mm -hmm. drove right past it um she said all right last place on the list let's go let's at least check it off mm -hmm. so we visited and weirdly enough Although our Airbnb was in Nashville, we chose to fly into Charlotte and drive into town. I'm not sure why. You can fly into Asheville Airport. And s let's say somewhat randomly, uh, we were going to meet the one person who we had been introduced to. We didn't know anybody in the whole region, but the one person we'd been introduced to. And he said, why don't we meet in Black Mountain? Mm -hmm. So we met in a little coffee shop in Black Mountain, which, by the way, as it turns out, was founded by one of the members of the church I go to. Mm -hmm. So we met there. We happened to walk around a little bit. Beautiful, like a very strong sense of, hmm, like that, hmm. Positive, positive. Went to Asheville, very nice place. It wasn't the right place for us. But we didn't have anywhere else to go. Hmm. So we decide on uh, January 15th of last year to just pull up stakes, got a, uh, uh, a three Airbnbs in Asheville, and my mom, came with mm. my daughter mm. like all right let's check this place out so we did one we moved to the next one by the time we got to the second place i said you know what why don't we just like eat all the deposits we put on these i think the answer is going to be black mountain mm. I, I see an airbnb we can get them let's do it sorry this wasn't january 15th this was actually like december 21st of last year not this most recent december but the one before it so we did it we went up there and it turns out to be a particular day called holly jolly which is kind of like a, uh, op everybody open, all the lights are on, all the businesses are open, everybody's kind of out playing music. Mm. It's a, a festival. At Black Mountain. At Black Mountain. Oh, wow. So a very nice impression. Yeah. And we were staying walking distance to town. Mm. Now, remember, I've got, I've got all the city and stuff in the back of my mind. Like, what are the design criteria for what the minimum viable um, form of human collaboration and ways that we live mm. must look like? So I've been looking to build this, looking for ingredients of what it might look like to design it. And now I'm taken by the fact that, yeah, this is a really good example of the kind of thing that you'd want to see. Mm. And so January 15th, we pulled the trigger. We get an Airbnb at Black Mountain. We said, we're going to try to figure it out. So we're staying in town. And now every day I start having these experiences of, well, let's say, wholesomeness and, and, and heartening. And in some sense, very simple stuff. And just walking around town and some old couple on their porch waves and invites me and my daughter to come up. We walk up to the porch. We sit down and have a chat with them for an hour and a half. The next day we're walking along and two ladies who just moved into town, uh, retired from being school teachers, invite us to come to the potluck uh, for their housewarming out of the blue, which is not that crazy. But in the real world, in the world we live in now, it's actually kind of crazy. Um, it's the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. and in some sense, it's a very simple way of doing things. And I should mention, by the way, the two ladies, they're married to each other. Mm. This is an interesting community, which is simultaneously has a lot of very old-fashioned values, and probably 90% of the community goes to church. Um, and yet at the same time actually has what we call it embodied inclusiveness, or maybe mm. even like embracing is better. Mm. Instead of including, embracing. Mm. Mm. Um, Distinction. And so it begins to grow. I mean, I start having these experiences of huh, wow, maybe I was actually quite arrogant huh. in some sense, thinking that we needed to design something new. Maybe the right answer has actually always been 
be invited into something that is, that is already. And then find a way to support and help be part of that. Which at that point was all I had left in me anyhow. So mm. it was a pretty good answer. Um, and we were embraced. I remember actually by probably about month, the end of month one, I still was very suspicious. And I walked up to the folks who lived across the way, who were old folks, probably mid 80s. And I said, all right, guys, when's the other shoe going to drop? Mm. And he smiled and he said, well, I've been here 40 years and it ain't dropped yet. Mm. I said, all right, good enough for me. We're in. <laughs> so these experiences of just you know, prof the profundity and, and the mystery of, okay, what's going on here? How did it happen? How did this place survive mm. to be still wholesome? Mm -hmm. And still be, they call it Mayberry, the people who live there. You know, still be, and, and I don't mean this, it's not a simulacrum of Mayberry. It really is a wholesome place. Mm -hmm. How did this place survive? And, <laughs> you know, Mayberry, I, I live in a Mayberry. I looked up Black Mountain, 8,000 people. My town's about 10,000 people. Um, it's where you know the mechanic you know your doctor, they're, they're friends that you grew up with, and now they're back. They moved home to raise their kids, to re-engage in the cycle of deep trust versus the options, the infinite options of a city. You know, me and my wife often joke about our food options at times, and we're just like, golly. But there are trade-offs. So Black Mountain is 15 miles from Asheville. And it was interesting, actually, right before this clip, he talks about they had gone up to the monastery and they worked their way all the way down. Up to the monastery, they worked their way all the way down. Talking about a hierarchy of value from the high to the low. He says they flew into Charlotte and then they drove in down into Asheville and then down into Black Mountain. It's just kind of interesting to hear that. Um, so why did, uh, well, let's just take a look at, um, let's just take a look at Asheville. Let's take a look at um, Black Mountain. So kind of see a little difference here. Tell me, when was the last time you let your mind wander? Or took a moment to just breathe, move to the beat of your own drum and dream. Here in Asheville, we're a mixture of genres, a hybrid of styles. Growers who are artists and artists whose work grows. Creators in fields and in kitchens. And vinyl, glass, chocolate, and clay. From the lady on the hill to the terrace at the grove. Settling for nothing. Hungry for everything. Butter biscuits and butter chicken. Broad-minded and the French broad. We are everyone for every single one, all drawn together to stand out. Deeply rooted, ever evolving. You are welcome. Always Asheville. Okay, so that's Asheville. Let's look at Black Mountain, where he ended up choosing. Already the music. <laughs> well, it's amazingly beautiful. There's something pretty magical about the natural landscape here. You can just walk out your front door, hop on your mountain bike, on your road bike. There's limitless things to do right here in and around the Black Mountain area. Black Mountain is a very special community. We're not that old as a town. Black Mountain really didn't get started until the railroad established a station in the early 1880s. We were founded based on visitors coming to the area. People down east would come up here to escape the hot weather. If you come to Black Mountain, you come here to see the scenery, enjoy the lovely food. We have lots of good food here and enjoy the history and the shopping because we have some amazing artists with amazing shops here. Our mission is to bring the people to the arts and the arts to the people. There is a long history of artists being attracted to Black Mountain. We have a lot of live music. Outdoor shows that can host well over a thousand folks. Music's a very important part of community and culture within Appalachia. 
amazing that a town of 8,000 people can have so many quality food and beverage establishments. There is such a strong sense of support and with each other's business. It's really a big sense of family in this community. My wife and I, we love the outdoors, we love beer, we love coffee, and we thought, well, man, if you put all those things together, that's a, that's a win. We want to be a community resource for those who love the outdoors. But the community is just a really warm, kind, welcoming community filled with really fascinating people. It really is hard to imagine that there's a better town in America to be able to go out with your family and spend community time together in a town that you're a part of. Of course, they co-op Asheville here, I guess, part of that, but um, that was Black Mountain. So, I mean, some of the distinctives I saw between the two places were you had people tell, the, pe the, the people of Black Mountain telling the story of Black Mountain versus a voice kind of narrating you what they want you to believe about Asheville. I mean, Asheville's much bigger, and I mean, but you could have got voices from the city to tell you about that. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then, you know, the tail end, it talks about just community, and, and, and Jordan highlights uh, safety. Well, I mean, he doesn't say that word, but that you feel safe to walk about. And actually in that, um, one of the shots in that video that we just watched, there's a, um, well, actually it may be on like the promo here. Let me see. For one, I mean, you, uh, there you can see a church up in the corner uh, of that downtown area, and I think one of the things that I mean, it's been eh, these ideas in this space in this corner that just kind of get in your mind, and and Peugeot's talk, you know, the the disordered life and the the shaping of a life that's you know. Uh, I think that's what Jordan Hall is touching on is this ordered life that's built on top of things. It's built from the bottom up, not from the top down. And I think that where you it's the family, it's it's the family, it's the community, it's religious practice, it's the businesses, then are that oh, the coffee shop was actually run by somebody who goes to my church and my family has moved to this safe place and we go to this church and then this business and and then the city, you know, that I think that's one of the interesting things about even that word city. Like, we have this modern idea of the city that's really a megatropolis. And a city, I mean, I live in a city. It's 10, 15,000 people with the surrounding community. You know, we have infrastructure, we have shopping, we have, uh, you know, um, a hospital, we have industry all these things but it's 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 in an there's a certain size where the what it means to administrate or govern millions of people is kind of ridiculous and to put one person you know at the top of that a governor or a mayor or, well a mayor of a city and so i just have some interesting or i feel like it's hard to keep the the hierarchy in a in a way that's recognizable it's very disordered and i think when he stepped in to that space he was actually stepping in he, you know a city was his criteria and i think the i the modern idea of city is kind of distorted and this kind of took me to thinking about tim keller's vision city to city and there is this i mean there is this balance where okay you have centers of innovation uh cult uh silicon valley Nashville, Music City, L.A., New York, you know, they have these identities. But they, the identities get so much bigger, and it's like, oh, well, we should also be this kind of industry city, and we should also be a banking city, and we should also be, you know, all these things. And, and then it's just built, and why? We, don't, we lose the foundation of the meaning on top of these things when you get past a certain point. I bet you could do some studies on city size function and what's um, attainable. I... So another way that I experienced this was when um, this disordered and, and inability to administrate was in, in this small community. So there are all these county schools surrounding our our town, and in, the governor of the, our state in two thousand three or four they they made a law that if you weren't if your school could maintain a certain quota of students, then they would have to consolidate to the bigger schools. 
okay, well, there's these bigger schools have more opportunity. They have more options for these kids that live in these rural, rural areas. So it's obviously going to be better if we can just get them into these bigger, more equipped, uh, you know, school systems. Well, when that happened, those school systems got overwhelmed. And the, and the quality of their education actually began to drop. And I, I think you could, you could extrapolate that out into, oh, well, let's, you know, the, the decisions that, the decisions to grow, if it's for the sake of growth and without real purpose, like, oh, this, on the, on the, they just need, you know, it's a simple idea. I mean, they, they, they'll have better opportunities if they go to the big school. Um, maybe. But I think that's a little short-sighted. So um, that's just kind of the c- thesis on the city. Um, I think he was drawn to Mayberry instead of, you know, the city, instead of Portlandia. And, uh, you know, Asheville's still only 15 miles. So, I mean, if there's, a, there's still good food, but where do I want to live? Where do I want to commune? Where do I want to have my being was not in the city, but it was still in a city. And that's why I think that word is, is kind of uh, tainted or colored in our current modern age. So I have had this same experience. I've traveled across the United States, uh, spent summers, full summers in, in different cities, uh, on the beach, in the mountains, in Nashville, uh, you know, in these spaces, and I've always come back home to a place that's very similar to Black Mountain. About, you know, 45 minutes away is the folk music capital of the United States. Um, you know, we're, we're nestled on the, this river. We same, same size. We have a downtown um, that's active. And, and, you know, the Cheers montage where everybody knows your name, the big show from the 80s, you know, that's to be known. And how can you be known in a city of a million people? Um, I, th- well, I won't. So I, I spent time on staff with a pastor who moved to where I live from Long Beach, California, where he'd grown up in, um, he'd grown up in, in L.A., in the L.A. area. He'd gone to UCLA, got a history degree. He went to Yale Divinity School, uh, got his MDiv there. And he came to this, you know, our, our kind of eclectic church. And we had renovated this old theater. Um, you know, we kind of had a, a little taste for the historical, but modern and so, he, he, you know, he was attracted to certain things. We had, you know, kind of a loosely reformed theology, and these things got a hit for him. He was a PCA-ordained pastor. And, you know, after he was here for a year, and he ended up being here for almost 10 years, uh, I asked him, so what, what's the biggest difference of being in the city versus being here? And he said, well, you know, it's actually not as big a difference as I thought. He was like, you know, if I really need something, we can order it on Amazon. And uh, if we want to go to the city for some city stuff, it's an hour and a half. It's a day drive. And we can do that, you know, and make a day trip out of it, but come back home. And they found that they enjoyed, you know, these, they found these small pockets of community. And, and through the church, you know, you're, a decent sized church in a small town is going to be connected to all sorts of business and um, resource of community where then you can build trust and, you know, and, and they are building trust in you and you're coming together around this sacred thing. So, and I just, I, I, I don't see how that scales very well because even at a church of several thousand in a large city, the, so say my church was around four or 500 at its peak time during that season in a town of 10,000. You're like almost at like one percent of the town, but if you have a church of five thousand in a town in a city that's greater than a million, you're still like, you know. And I know there are pockets and cities and communities and all those things, but there's something to that. There is something to it. 
Um, I think that you can watch these videos. Of, if you look at that, that town, Black Mountain, and it's enchanting. And, you know, we hit on that here, this disenchanted, disordered life. You know, it's, it's, dis, it's enchanting. And I think that Jordan was immediately attracted to that if it wasn't on a conscious level, on a subconscious level of this. You know, he talks about there's like a diversity, but the diversity isn't the foundation for the community. It's actually like trust and values. He said it was underneath this diversity where if you kind of look at the video for, say, Asheville, it was like, we are a diverse community. We have all these things, but that's like our core value. But that has to be nested in something for it to really bind. And I think he saw that there. He found that there. And, and he goes on, and, you know, it, it, it drove him deeper. What is going on here drove him deeper into religion, actually. So I, I just found it fascinating. Um, you saw this happen, too, with uh, COVID. There was this disconnect from embodied community. And... It was, in, it was interesting. So in my town, there was kind of this history and tradition where high schoolers and college-age kids would go hang out by the river. There's this park, and there's this whole, you know, strip. And, and that was the social media before there was social media. And you see movies like American Graffiti with the car culture, and, and that's where you get the goings-on, and that's where the goings-on happens, for better and for worse. But there's something uh, grounded and true about that. And I watched that culture in our town over the last, you know, five, six, seven years start to dry up and, and it cease to exist because what I realized even when I was helping do like youth ministry in our town was that the people were hanging out in digital spaces. And this started, this happened for five or six years. And then after COVID, I saw a re-happening of this uh, hangout culture in our town. And of course, there can be you know, some unseemly things that happen in those kind of places, but there's, there's the nature of this embodied space of being together and being in community. And, and, with, and the city kind of, you know, our town kind of gave youth that. They kind of let them have it. You know, the cops would go through there and sometimes and make sure things weren't getting too crazy, but it was, you know, it was kind of this, this culture. And, and I kind of missed it when it went away as a, as a real conservative kid. And I was like, oh, the river... You know, but as I as I watched it disappear, and I, I I was thinking about it culturally, I was like, oh, this serves a really interesting space for the growing up of, where you have this you know hang hang hangout space, and and I think you know this this city has you know um, music and 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 these outdoor events, and and we have things like that in our town as well, and I don't know, I think that. He was drawn to something that is true. And he said that cities were a like a hundred percent criteria. Like his idea of a city was his one hundred percent criteria for um, finding a place of being. And that broke down. I would just argue to say that he still is in a city, but he's in a more he's not he's not in a disordered city, but in a more ordered city, an ordered way of life city closer to this pattern of ideal that I think is, is a reality. Uh, let's see what else. Oh. I said cities are real and needed, but it's possible cities are overrated and we are in a post-city culture. Hubs of innovation are good and necessary, but it's built on disorder and not sustainable. And you see that in San Francisco. So the last point I'll make on this topic of some, a vibration that I think that Jordan Hall was experiencing that led to his com conversion to Christianity that, well, I have one last, uh, kind of a large last point, but is... In, in a town, you know who's going to take, do you know who, or in any situation, you know who's going to take the best care of you? 
the person who cares about you. Whether that's a doctor or a mechanic or a lawyer or a business professional or a nurse or a teacher or a plumber or an electrician. The person who's going to take get best care of you is the person who cares about you. And that's hard to find in a metropolitan area. You are a number. You are a commodity. You are a sale. You are not a person. And that's why I like my small town. I believe strongly that we are called to help the poor. But if all of us, if all we do in the world is get everybody to have more stuff, we will not solve the problem of despair, of sterility, of fragmentation, divorce. In fact, we will increase it. And so it seems like the ideas that Plato brought to light have to be explored and taken seriously once again. That is, the world can no longer be described only in terms of forces and stuff, but it has to be described in terms of categories of human consciousness, like attention, like relevance, like care. And maybe for some of you that is too much of a jump to say that the world is made of care or that the world is made of love, but at least an acknowledgement that the human world is made of care, right? That without care, there is death, that without care, there's paralysis. And if we care for the wrong things, then there is chaos and tyranny in our lives and in our societies. And this is where I think that maybe I can help bridge some of the more religious and secular people. That's why I'm still here. So I want to give, I want to kind of close out with these two pictures of things, the deeper things that undergird Black Mountain. That, that Black Mountain is kind of, is built, their culture is kind of built upon these two things. So let's check these out. This is Billy Graham's retreat center uh, at the Cove. And we can kind of just watch this little montage here. So if you don't know who Billy Graham is, he's one of the biggest um, evangelists of the 20th century. He... He was, you know, he did these large rallies that um, are kind of remnants now of the only person doing that kind of thing is actually Donald Trump, which he is not Billy Graham. Uh, but, you you know, you see this beautiful um, structure. It looks kind of like a chapel or church. And, and this is nestled right next to Black Mountain. There's a cross there. This is... This is the heart of evangelicalism in America. And I think that that is, you know, for all of the high church-ness of this space, uh, you know, and you hear it in Jordan as he, as he gets into his theological journey now. He's reading the church fathers, and he's wrestled with original sin and all these things. Um you know, he may, that may be another part of, another step in his journey, but right now, what, he was evangelized by evangelicalism. <laughs> like, uh, for all the, you know, uh, grief that we give evangelicalism at times, like, you gotta give credit where credit's due. Um, so this is the other one. This is Ridgecrest Conference Center. I spent time here in the past, and it's, you know, where they can have, you can have these camps and you can have uh, conferencing. And it's, it, it was um, originally a Southern Baptist encampment where kids would go to church camp every summer. And, um, and they still do, they still have camps there. And, and this is the other, you know, it serves it, it, a lot of, Local volunteers come here. A lot of people retire and, and come help keep these places going. Come for the view, leave with a vision. Maybe Jordan has come with a vision, leave, stay for the view. But I just thought that those were some um, fascinating things that, that hit me 
in his conversion story and that I relate to as far as what he is drawn, what he is drawn to and, and how his um, preconceived conceptions and notions about what it means to have a whole, he talked about have a whole life and being, but that he felt wholesomeness and heartedness in the small community. Um, you know, I spent time in the young, restless, reformed, going to some conferencing, and I had had some success with, you know, in this itinerant ministry kind of space, And but I stayed in this little town, and I would talk to people at these conferences. I'd even done some events that people in the conference had done like the previous year, so it was like, you know, I had this kind of connection, but every time that they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, where are you from? And I would say this small town. Go, oh, okay. You know, like there was a automatic judgment of my ability or my value to them as a person, and I could feel it. And, um, and it, I was self-conscious of it, and, it, you know, it was, it was hard to deal with, but... Um, you know, I think Jordan Hall gets it. So, all right, we'll uh, see what thoughts we have next time.